make it so that we're on the right spot when we're presenting our lures. Now, we can't do that without knowing what's down there. And in most cases, the, the contour maps don't give us the actual uh, uh, detail of what's down there. So we have to get that on our own. Uh, fishing is tougher because we don't have any tracks and, and uh, uh, we can't really walk around the terrain and all that. So what we have to do, we have to use our depth sounder and we have to use our lures to see and feel the bottom. Uh, the structure on the bottom and finding the pathways that the fish use. Now, what's the way we confirm the fact that we can't find the pathways? Basically, it's catch the fish. So we got to be fishing at the same time we're learning this bottom mm -hmm. structure. Uh, both deer and fish, when the weather changes, both deer and fish will vary their pattern on how they go on these pathways. So what we have to do is uh, not necessarily say, okay, the, the fish are going to come from their sanctuary, their deep water home, move all the way up to the shallows and move all the way back. That isn't always true. And the, the weather can make a big difference in that. The water color can make a difference in that. The clearer the water, the deeper the fish. And so we have to pay attention to those things. Uh, first of all, we'll get the first slide here. I don't know if this mic is working too well. Let me move it up a little bit. Can, can you hear me now? Maybe a little bit more. Uh, we'll, we'll see how this goes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll give it a try here. Okay. Uh, the, uh, now, who studied structure first? Uh, in the 1930s and the 1940s, uh, a 16-year scientific study on fish, their behavior, and their reaction to their environment was done by a college physics professor named Buck Perry from Hickory, North Carolina. Mr. Perry is now considered the father of modern-day structure fishing. And this is the uh, plaque that's in the, the uh, Fishing Hall of Fame uh, uh, in, I believe it's in Wisconsin. Uh, Mr. Perry determined that the key to finding active fish is a detailed knowledge of the bottom lake structure. Fish have a deep water home area, and once or twice on an average fishing day, they become active and may move towards the shallows on pathways. How far they go and how long they stay is dependent on the weather and water conditions at that time. Weather and water can change, those pathways will change, or at least how far they go on. Uh, which fish use structure? Well, basically, all fish use structure. Uh, <coughs> Uh, the following fish pictures I'm going to show you, most of them were caught well, within an hour's drive to Grand Rapids, and uh, they were all caught on a number of different lures. We use spoon plugs for mapping tools, but we also use other lures. And uh, they were caught on crankbaits, spoons, blades, blade baits, jigs. They were caught deep, they were caught shallow, they were caught fast, they were caught going slow. The one thing that th these fish had in common was they all were caught on structure. And these structures were explored previously to catching the fish. Uh, the details were known previously to catching the fish. Uh, these fish were caught on purpose. Now this is the largemouth bass. <coughs> this is the first species I, I'm going to show. And these guys, they're tough, they're mean, they got a big mouth. They're, they're just fun, fun to catch. It's one of my favorite fish. Uh, they're aggressive and they jump. And uh, one thing you can do, because you really don't want them to jump unless you want to lose them, because the big, biggest fish can really throw those, especially the larger lures. So you stick your rod way down in the bottom, in the, in the water, and you crank fast. If you see your line rising up, if you hook a fish in deep water, you see your lines coming up the surface, you better get your rod tip in the water and start cranking. You'll pull his head down so that he won't tend to go up. So try that trick and, uh, and only let them jump when you got your net under them. Because they can jump. They're great, they're great fight, fighters. Now the largemouth bass is the uh, most severely affected fish of all the species to cold fronts. Uh, changes in, in the weather. Uh, and they are the toughest to catch consistently on a consistent basis. If you can learn to catch adult bass consistently the other species aren't really going to be a problem for you. So concentrating on the bass only for the reason 
that if you can take care of him, the other fish are going to come come along. Uh, they're just a great, a great fish to, uh, to catch. These are a couple of six pounders within a lake, uh, within an hour drive of Grand Rapids. It's my daughter. She loves to fish. I started her when she was really young, and uh, she just gets a real kick out. That's the first time I ever got her to touch a fish, but uh, we uh, we have a good time. Now the northern pike, this guy is vicious, he's got teeth, they get large, uh, they're fast. Uh, I've caught them going over eight miles an hour on a trolley. Uh, not, not always, but uh, sometimes they can really, you can really kick it up, depending on the weather and water. They need a straight shot at the lure. They, they have to come in behind the lure to, uh, to, to trigger a strike. One thing you can do as you're trolling along, drop your rod back real quick. That'll change the speed, and that speed change can trigger a <laughs> reflex strike on the pike. They're uh, often caught up fast, trolling fast on deep brake lines and weed lines. Get down on the base of that brake line and, uh, and keep your lure down in that area. <laughs> I probably get a little bit of a uh, cringe from this one, but uh, <laughs> this is a red horse sucker. And as, as I said, I like to catch all kinds of species. And uh, I had a ball with this fish. This was in the Grand River. It put up a great fight. And they're kind of colorful, with red on the fins. Uh, this was last fall in the Grand River. This fish weighed five pounds, was 24 inches long. It, did, it qualified for a master angler. Uh, I caught it on a structure at the head of a hole that I they never caught a sucker in that hole before, but I'd previously gotten and mapped it and gotten some smallmouth bass out of it. Well, this, one, this day that I came there, the smallmouth bass were not active. But I hooked into this guy, and I, I had a ball. Uh, you don't know what fish are going to be active at the time. So if you target just one, then, then uh, you may be limiting your, your enjoyment of fishing. But anyway, I had a ball catching them, and uh, they are, uh, they're fun to catch. Smallmouth bass, uh, they're a beautiful fish. This is one out of the Grand River. and. Uh, they're very colorful, just really a neat fish, and they jump. They will go all over the place. They're hard to hook because they're all over the place, they're really fast. And when you get into a school of, of uh, smallmouth and they move up onto structure, they may only be there for five or ten minutes and they're gone. They haven't stopped biting, they're just gone. They just took off. And so you better be able to present your lures in a quick and efficient manner to get uh, uh, them in numbers. Uh, just, just a ball to catch. It's really fun. Oh, they're, uh, they are probably about as hyper as any fish. If there's any fish that I, we should give Prozac to, these guys would be it, because they're all over the place. But I love them the way they are, so I'm not going to give them any Prozac. They're really fun to catch. One of my favorites. Now, another cringe from this one, probably. Channel catfish, though. These are neat fish. They are tasty. This one's out of Reed's Lake. Caught it off a hump in Reed's Lake, an underwater hump, about nine, nine pounds, I think. They're a strong fighter, and they will take artificials, especially if they're bottom bouncing. That's one of the things we do with our spoon plugs is we bounce the bottom, and it triggers the reflex on the fish. Great fish. Channel cat. Uh, musky. Uh, these guys are nasty. And they're mean and large. Uh, they got teeth, and I don't know. Uh, I had the the greatest jump that I've ever experienced a couple of years ago fishing Lake Erie, and I hooked into a muskie, and I was standing up in the boat, and I had to look up at the fish. This guy was like three lengths out of the water, three of his body lengths out of the water. He was a pretty decent sized fish. Uh, they are fun. They are they're just an exciting fish, and they uh, they just. Uh, uh, I, you know, they're one of mine that I just enjoy fishing. Uh, this one uh, was caught in uh, Makatawa. Uh, one of the things about, we caught this while we were fishing a walleye tournament. And uh, that's about, I think it's 37 inches and 16 pounds. Wasn't even a keeper, but uh, we took a quick picture and released it. Uh, but we had a ball. And there, on the on the walleye tournament, uh, only two boats caught walleye, 
and uh, there were 40 boats in the tournament. And these guys really know how to catch fish. But uh, we had a ball because we didn't necessarily concentrate on that. We, it just was our choice. Uh, we really enjoyed it. We caught a smallmouth that day too. And uh, it's, I, I like to look at the, when you design your fishing approach for all species, uh, you're just, your chances of enjoyment are greater. Can't, chances of getting something are, are greater, I think. This is a muskie that was caught up at Intermediate Lake. Uh, biggest fish I've ever brought into my boat, uh, 51 and a half inches and uh, 36 pounds. Uh, this was a fish of a lifetime, and uh, you certainly don't get a shot at a fish like that very often. But it's just really a thrill. Here's another one. Probably get a, uh, a little boo on this one. I don't know. These drum are fighters. They really fight. Uh, they take artificials very well, even though they have a small mouth. They'll take artificials very readily. They're like a big bluegill. They go side, sideways on you. And uh, they can pull. Uh, they get good size, too. Now, they do eat zebra mussels, so they're great fish for that. Uh, so as far as I'm concerned, let's keep them around a little bit. Uh, because uh, they, they do a function that we want accomplished. Uh, the, uh, the largest one I've caught uh, was in uh, Makatawa last spring. It was uh, 28 inches and 17 pounds. I didn't know what fish that was for about 15 minutes or more. And I have pretty heavy equipment. He just took off and very powerful. Uh, also, you get into a school of these things, and it is exciting. Uh, Brent, who was handing out things at the door, went with me on, uh, Brent, was that last year? Last uh, summer. Last summer. Uh, that uh, we got into a school of these drum on uh, Spring Lake it was, wasn't it? Yep. I think it was Spring Lake. And uh, we, we must have hooked over 30 fish in less than an hour. And they all were 20 to 25 inches. And if you don't call that fun, it was just exciting. We had a great time. And so, uh, so they are drum, but they're fun to catch. Here's one. Uh, <laughs> I hear groans on this one. Uh, this is from the Grand River. This is a carp. It's about a 15-pounder. Uh, it's really kind of a pretty fish. <laughs> if, if any fish was to be called a, a bronzeback, that one I think could be. <laughs> you know, I mean, you, uh, you have to uh, maybe accommodate a little bit on that one. But they take artificials very readily. They'll take a bottom-bouncing lure and uh, strike it. Uh, they're, they're powerful fish. They really put up a fight. It's, it's unbelievable how good a fight they can give you. Well, this was out of Lake Michigan. I took an artificial lure and uh, I'll buy the pierhead. And I was fishing alone. My scale went to 25 pounds. He went beyond that. I don't know how much he weighed. But uh, I never had as much a fight as when I had that fellow on. And we, it just was an exciting time. This is walleye now. This is, this is a great fish. This is one that uh, much, much sought after. They're excellent eating. Uh, they're a great fish. They uh, normally take a slower lure, though, like a live bait or a slow, slow troll lure. But I've caught them going up to 10 miles an hour under, under the right conditions. So you should check your speeds. Whenever you fish for walleye or any fish, if you aren't getting them at one speed or one depth, check your other speeds and depths. Uh, that's real important, that's real critical to uh, uh, being thorough in your fishing. These fish uh, normally are caught off of deep humps and the channel break lines. And they're a migratory fish, they, uh, they will stay in an area. In other words, a group, they, they'll, like in a large reservoir, they'll move around that reservoir. So if you catch one fish in a particular area, you better fish that area, structures in that area and that structure more thoroughly because they're very likely are more around. You don't want to go zipping off to an area where maybe the, the group of uh, walleye isn't. So uh, make sure that you check an area thoroughly when you fish. This one's out of Reed's Lake. Flathead catfish. <coughs> now this is again out of the uh, Grand River, which I lately enjoy fishing considerably. It's just all kinds of stuff in there and it's really fun. Uh, this is about a 20 pounder, caught on a, an artificial lure. Uh, these guys are hard to bring up. You, they just don't want to come up. And uh, really a fight, just really fun. Uh, you don't 
you do not put your hand in their mouth, period, uh, on a big catfish like this. Uh, I've been told that they will crush metal lures. If they, if they get them down in their mouth, they'll just crush them, they'll bend them. So, uh, a word to the wise. This one's about a 40 pounder from uh, White Lake. That's some big fish in there. They're fun to catch. Now, salmon. And I used to do a fair amount. Uh, we had a place up at Ludington. And uh, now, uh, because I use a smaller boat, I get out only in the good weather and I don't go way out. But I still enjoy catching salmon. And uh, when the weather conditions are well, uh, spring and fall especially. This is the king salmon. And these guys, are, they have a pretty hard mouth. And, and to set a hook, uh, you've got to be, uh, a lot of guys use a single hook rather than the trebles because they get more power in the set. Um, but they are fast. And they're, they're really power, power fish, really fun to catch. A lot of people don't uh, feel that there's a structure out in Lake Michigan. But the fact is that there is very, they're very gradual structure, and that's the area to concentrate. When they say they're catching fish in 180 feet, there could be a break line. If it goes flat out, and then at 180 feet, it may go down 10 or 20 feet in 100 feet, and then back to the flat. That is a structure. That is a break line. They will follow those. Uh, in Lake Michigan, the best structure is Sobble Point. <coughs> The most fish and the biggest fish are caught off of Sobble Point. North of Ludington, guys will run up eight miles up there to fish. That is a structure. It's a huge bar. It drops right down into 100, 160 feet, I think. I can't remember exactly. It's been a while since I fished it. But that is, that is a sign that shows you how much fish concentrate on structure. Uh, it's harder to get them out in the, the broader areas, but you can find some subtle break lines. But these guys, these king salmon are really something. They generally are a little bit deeper. Uh, than the other salmon. Steelhead. These guys are fast and they jump and they're fun. Fun catch. Uh, this one's caught in, in the Grand River. Uh, they're great eating. I, I enjoy eating steelhead uh, just about as good as anything. Normally they're higher up in the water column when they're out in the big lake. This was caught in an eight foot hole in the Grand River. Uh, any fish Wherever they are, they'll use the structure that's available. If the deepest water in the area is only eight feet, that's where their home is going to be. Uh, they could, you know, these are the migratory fish is on a, on a migratory run, but uh, that definitely is, uh, they'll use what's there. Some more steelhead from the Grand River. <clears throat> these are uh, coho. Uh, they normally are a little higher up in the water column too. These are from the spring at Port Sheldon. And uh, the structure that we caught them on was the bubbler. Now that's got rock structure, change in the bottom. It's also got current structure coming out. And fish will go on a current edge too. That's part of, that could be part of structure. Uh, so we have to pay attention to structure of any kind. And that's man-made structure. Uh, brown trout, they're colorful and uh, they're good eating. Uh, the springtime, I like to fish these uh, out off the, in Lake Michigan. You control these ridges that go uh, where the, where the uh, ice, uh, and the winter ice will dump all this sand in ridges and the wave action will form ridges on Lake Michigan. And these guys are, are fun to catch early in the spring to go out there and you troll along these ridges. Use that as your guideline in structure. Now, these are not in Michigan, as far as I know, unless somebody can tell me. The striper. But if you ever get a chance to go and fish down south somewhere where these guys are, uh, <laughs> they're unbelievable. They, they, they're, they're like a freight train, and you cannot stop them. Uh, they're, they're tackle busters. I hooked a, a five-pounder once down the Tennessee River. I couldn't stop them, and I got some pretty heavy equipment. Uh, once they, did, you know, once you wear them out a little bit, then they come in a little better. But there's so runs that they make that, uh, you know, this is about a 35 pounder. I can't imagine catching one of those, but I would like to try. But uh, anyway, they are. There's something. If you ever get a chance to fish them, go for it. Uh, they normally are caught, uh, or they're talked about uh, busting the surface. You know, a lot of these bait fish are up there, and uh, that's that can be done. You go and you cast the area where the fish are, but. Uh, Normally, fairly infrequent uh, 
time do you get to do that? You can't be sitting around waiting for them to bust the surface. Uh, normally they're caught in the channel brake lines and the deep humps off the channel, uh, especially where the feeder cuts come in. And this is on reservoirs, normally they're planted in reservoirs. And white bass, uh, these come in large schools often. Uh, they're good fighters for their size, and they got a pretty good mouth. Like a crappie doesn't have too uh, hard a mouth. These guys got a hard mouth, and they put up a good fight. Uh, one after another, it's just, just get in a school of those about. The Detroit River has a bunch of them, and they're fun to get in the spring when they come up. Where's, uh, uh, we talk about the Detroit River over there. You, he was saying they get in the way, weren't you? They, they get, get in your way for when you're after musky, but uh, they're fun to catch. And they, Lake Makatawa does have some. I caught a 16 and a half incher uh, last spring there. And so they have some decent fish in there too. Uh, now, as, as I said before, all of these fish were caught on a structure situation. And uh, they, they were previously learned and mapped. Uh, we seldom just go out and we say, oh gee, that's a good looking spot. I'm on a new lake, that's a good looking spot. I'm gonna fish here. Seldom do we get fish that are really decent fish when we do that. It's when we have mapped that, we know the bottom form, we come back and fish it on a, on a, a periodic basis throughout the day that we can hit the fish when they move. So it's very rare that we'll hit them right, uh, right at that time, you know, the first time. Uh, on all of these structures that, that we caught these fish, detail maps could be drawn. We could draw a little, okay, here's an outline of the form of the, of the break line and things like that. It's not a big deal, but if you can put that in your mind, uh, you're a lot better off in your fishing. And some people ask, well, what, uh, how do you target the biggest, biggest fish of all species? How do you do that? Uh, basically, it's understanding structure. The more structures you see, the more you know about what, comp what structure is composed of. And uh, the best structure is the best lot. It's just like on the Serengeti Plain. Uh, all the grazing animals are all over the plain. There's one little clump of trees. Who gets the clump of trees? The big cats meanest and the biggest. That's the same way with a fish. So think about it a little bit. You want to look for structure and it takes a while to, to understand and visualize these structures but it's worth it because it really does pay off. Club Perry Spoon Plug Training Center. All this material that I'm presenting here comes from uh, this material from Buck Perry's training center. Uh, Buck, Buck Perry is the director. He's 87 years old now but still Still pretty darn active for his age, and uh, still got a great mind. Uh, Director of Education is Terry O'Malley, and Terry is a, a great fisherman and a top instructor. Uh, and this is uh, this is Terry O'Malley here. He does a real nice job on here. Uh, structure situation. Uh, this is a list of the 17 basic structure situations we find in both reservoirs, natural lakes, oceans, and rivers. And so, if we can recognize what we have, we're a lot better off. Uh, we're going to define uh, what is a structure situation. It's the bottom features that fish use in their movements and migrations. It's composed of structure, brakes, brake lines, and deep water. So you need all those factors in to make a structure situation. Basically, it's structure that fish use. That's the, that bottom line there, a structure situation. And why do they use it? Because it goes all the way from the deepest water in the area to the shallows and back. It's a, it's a pathway for the fish, as we were talking about earlier. Uh, what I'm going to show you are the, are the line, just line drawings, and, and these will in reality, there's no two structures alike, and that's the beauty of, of what we have to learn. And uh, the more we learn, the, the better we get, basically. Uh, there's only six of these, and I, I better get my little marker out here, but there's six of them that we find in our natural lakes here in Michigan. Uh, there's bars, there's uh, reefs, wide sweeping bars, islands, saddles, and humps. Those are the six that we find in natural lakes like we have here in Michigan. The rest of them are found in reservoirs, man-made as a general rule, uh, and those are areas that a lot of people will say, well, gee, why, you 
you know, why include reservoir stuff when they're up here in Michigan? Well, there's two reasons that, that they're included in, in this material. In the first place, we do have some reservoirs here. And they have the structures that he talks about. For a Tippy Dam, Allegan Dam, Sessions Lake, Hamlin Lake, Croton Dam, Hardy Dam. Now, the drowned river mouths, uh, White, Muskegon, Makatawa, they have stru man-made structure situations that uh, also are the reservoir type man-made. And those are areas we need to know about those structures, how to fish them. Uh, the second, probably most important reason uh, that we show the reservoir structures is that we can improve our fishing skills. First of all, knowing about them. Second of all, getting on the water and looking at them and fishing them. Reservoirs are much more difficult to fish than natural lakes because there's more structure options for the fish to use. And they change more on the seasonal basis, too. Uh, there's, just, there's just more options for them. One thing that kind of hit me, I was talking to Terry O'Malley the other night, he said 90% of the fishing waters in the United States are reservoirs. Here we are up in Michigan, we see all these natural lakes. 90% of the fishing water are reservoirs. So if we want to become versatile fishermen, be able to fish all waters, we better learn about the structures that are present in reservoirs too, and maybe try fishing them a little bit if we get a chance. If we move, go someplace else and fish, then we're, uh, we have a little bit of knowledge on how to fish those. Because you get on a big reservoir and you're lost. And that's what we try to do is to make that organized and make it uh, easier to fish those areas. Now this is the first one, bars. They're the most common uh, types of structure, and they're in the natural lakes. Uh, they're ridge-like. Uh, you can look at the terrain and see the terrain. And, okay, there's a bar there. Uh, this is the drop-off to the deep water. And the deep water sanctuary, the fish in this area, they move up onto the bar, and then they move along break lines on the bar. Uh, very simple. Of course, there's a lot of different shapes and forms of them. We call that the contact point, where the fish actually contact the, the bar from the deep water uh, home sanctuary. Now this is what we call a near perfect bar. The reason it's near perfect is because this is in a reservoir where the channel, the deepest water in the air, which is the home of the fish, goes along the side of the bar. The fish <coughs> up on this bar can drop down to the deep water anywhere along that bar. They've got very quick access to deep water. If they need to retreat, their pathway is right down there. So these are great. Now, if you fish Muskegon Lake at all, right out in front of uh, the uh, Bear Lake Channel, there's this huge bar, and then right on the side of it is what we call a downhill break line, right down there. That's a, that's a perfect bar type of situation. Take a look at it. At least you can see what, what it's like. Slide or wash. Uh, this can be a cave-in uh, that causes a bar to form. Uh, dirt normally, and then it, the, the bar goes out to the deepest water in the area. Now, if that bar didn't go out and there was a flat in here, it wouldn't be any good. The pathway isn't there for the fish. So we look for uh, where it goes all the way, to the deepest water to the, to the shallows. Uh, reefs, we have these in our natural lakes, and uh, Lake Michigan, uh, Lake Erie, Rocky reefs doesn't necessarily mean that there's there's any difference in depth, but we got a bottom structure, rocks that are different from the surrounding area. Uh, can be all flat. These things can be two, three miles out into the lake. Uh, also, look at the shoreline. There, if you if you see rocks on the shoreline or stones, uh, that's a sign there could be a reef there. Go and look at it. You, if you're out there, uh, take a look at it. It can be uh, very uh, interesting. That could be where you could catch some fish. Some of the reefs have uh, break lines that are dropped by the glaciers, that were dropped by the glaciers, were uh, different melting periods of the formation of the Great Lakes. Those are the areas that we need to concentrate on. We don't want to be fishing in this area here. We want to fish these break lines where the rocks are more concentrated. So we know already we've limited, eliminated a lot of water that we want to present our lures on, just by knowing that. Wide sweeping bars, uh, a good example of that is Hamlin Lake in the North Bayou, uh, huge bar. It's about, it goes about a mile out into the lake. 
and uh, maybe a couple miles wide. Maybe I'm, I don't know if I'm exaggerating that or not, but it's just a huge bar. Where do you start on something like that? Well, we, we look at the brake lines, or we try to find uh, a faster brake. Now, this, this is a faster brake where the contour lines come closer together. Uh, 15 feet down to 38 feet. Now, where's the deepest water? Uh, this 38 feet is the deepest water that's that close to the bar anywhere. That's the place where the fish are going to come up. That's the, the contact point is going to be right here. Then they can spread along brake lines on the, on the structure. Uh, let's see, let's go to the next one here. This, this, so, so then you have a, you're on a new lake and you look at that, you don't have a contour map. Uh, maybe even if you do, uh, where do you start? Uh, it's an uneven, so we follow the brake line. First of all, what you do is you follow the brake line. Maybe it breaks from like on the north bar in, uh, uh, in Hamlin Lake, it starts at about 15, 16 feet and then it drops down to, I think, 22 or 24 feet. Uh, stop the, uh, start on the top of that brake line and follow. Where's some fingers? Where's some points? Where's some features? Uh, maybe you'll run across a sunken boat or something, too. Those are brakes that fish can pause at. Uh, those are areas we want to do some concentrated fishing on. But then we find out where the fingers are or the features. Then what do we do? Well, which one might be the best one? We take some soundings. We just run off each point. 19 to 36. That's as deep a water as we found here. That's that's going to be the, the break the uh, contact point as a general rule. So if we're going to, we may want to fish those other ones too, but we want to concentrate our efforts. The best place we have to catch uh, catch a fish. Two uh, an island between two channel. Uh, the downstream side of this is on has some debris on it, and it's a longer type of bar. And so this often is the, is the better structure to fish. However, the front end of that island uh, can be built up with uh, sand deposits from the, the, the current going across the island. And uh, uh, that can be a hump, and those, you have to check that too. So you want to check both those areas. Sometimes the contact point is way down at the end of that. Sometimes it's up on the side. So you don't know. You have to look it over, and you have to fish it. By fishing it, you find out. Saddles. Like between a point and an island, or between two islands, or between two humps, you've got an area that goes down and then comes back up again. And uh, the saddle area, the base of the saddle area right there, if that's 30 to 35 feet or greater, that could be sanctuary depth, and the fish may pause there and stay there as their home area under certain weather conditions. Uh, then you can present and have a greater chance of catching the fish. Now, if that's a clear water lake, that depth may have to be 55 or 60 feet. So the clearer the water, the deeper the fish are going to be when they're in their home sanctuary. You can troll and cast a satellite. You can concentrate your fishing. Instead of going all around these, these here, this area, you can concentrate your fishing in this area here, both the shallows, the deep, uh, different speeds and different depths, uh, and you have a much better, greater chance of catching fish. Humps, all sizes. They come in uh, deep and shallow. This is a this is a uh, shallow one, and you have a pathway from the deepest water in the area all the way up to the uh, the shallows, which is eight to ten feet and less. And he, uh, Mr. Perry designates that. Shallows is 8 to 10 feet or less because the fish act differently in the shallows than they do in the deep water. That's the basic reason. Often these humps will have a, a marker on them. Sometimes they just you look out over the lake and you see one area where there's just a little, little wave breaking and the rest of the lake is all flat. Uh, and there's just a light breeze. Uh, that's a shallow. This indicates it's shallow in water. You can go out there and take a look. Uh, the dead end or the deep humps can be dead ends for fish migrations to the shallow. Sometimes they'll migrate along the base of the humps in the channel break line, and your migratory fish like the, the walleye, the northern, the muskie, and the, the uh, stripers will use those if they're on structural uh, break lines along the bottom, but uh, they're not going to be a, a total pathway. Uh, islands, if you see islands, 
in a lake, look for homes, because they're very likely it's going to be more homes. So take a good look. And they all aren't on uh, the map. Sometimes they are, but you, you'd be surprised what you find sometimes. You have to go and, and look, on, uh, look at it yourself. Delta situation. Now, we don't see that much up here. If you ever fish the Tennessee River, uh, the big reservoirs in the Tennessee River, they have the delta situation, which includes the channel, the delta ridge, the flats, and the short bars. Now, fish will not cross a flat. They need a pathway. And so we need something that will allow the fish to get to the, sh the, the shallows. And so what we need is a feeder cut. And this is a delta situation feeder stream cut. Basically, the, the flowing water has cut a grapevine or a, a little channel, and the fish will follow that. The fishing area is out here, the most important fishing area. Now, in good weather conditions, they can move up into that feeder cut, and especially in the springtime, uh, you can catch uh, fish up in that area. But that is the structure or the pathway that's cut through this delta here, the delta ridge, and gives them a pathway all the way to the shallows. This wash over here, um, you, if you troll by it and catch a fish, you might want to stop and cast. But again, that is not a pathway all the way to the shallows. Steep shorelines. Uh, these are found in highland and canyon reservoirs. And they also, uh, the steeper shorelines in our natural lakes and our lakes are good for the cold winter season. The fish have quick access to the deep water. This, uh, and that's important for in the cold season especially. Uh, the, uh, often there's a lot of hanes and rocks. These are tough to fish. Uh, often there's, in these lakes in the, in the highland and the canyon reservoirs, which are out west and, and uh, real high mountainous areas, uh, you're better off to head towards the, the headwaters. Move up where you have more gradual structures that you can fish and see more directly, and often there's better water color. So you're, you, you can be if the water's too clear uh, in a steep, rocky shoreline like this, you could be reducing your chances of catching fish, is what I'm saying. Bar between two channels. This is a good thing to fish where two uh, channels come in uh, and meet. Uh, that bar uh, fish often use, so you've got to check that. This is in uh, where, like up in a cove in uh, Spring Lake, has coves like this where they divide in there. There's a little bar in between them. In the springtime, when fish are going up into spawning, uh, those are great areas to check. Side feeder stream cut. Uh, there's two short bars here. These are areas where we do our concentrated fishing. Uh, they have deep water access, and this is a, a channel that's cut in there for you. Now, when we get into a little longer situation, where we have flats here, the two areas are the bars here where we have the contact points. Those areas we want to concentrate our fishing. We may want to follow the break line in the channel here. Uh, if it's springtime, we may want to go up in here and, and both break lines and fish those. Now this is a one that that's, could be huge. These are more often on the big wide floodplain uh, reservoirs, but they got huge flats. Now that could be a mile long, but flat. Uh, we've got four bars to fish. To check at least. These bars out here are the main areas in the springtime and uh, good weather conditions. The fish can move along this break line up to these uh, bars in the feeder cut. The springtime especially. The submerged roadbed. Uh, there's at least one of these in Hardy Dam, and I haven't really looked it over real well yet, but uh, we don't have a lot of them around here. But they are a great pathway. If you get on a reservoir and you see a submerged roadbed, and a lot of your ramps uh, will be a submerged roadbed. They'll, they'll make their ramps from the, from the road. Uh, and the road will just go right down to the main channel, which is a pathway for the fish. Uh, these are the abutments that uh, the, uh, the old bridge was before they flooded the reservoir. These four areas are great areas of contact points where the fish will move from the deep water channel up into the roadbed and towards the shallows. Make sure you fish over the troll and cast, the top of that, and the base break line of these, of these roads, where the, the, the road comes down and then it's flat. That base break line can be very good for fish. 
Benzerohedral. These are in cooling lakes. They have some of those in Illinois and uh, uh, down south, uh, west, out west they have them. Uh, they're basically farmland that's been flooded. And what you have is uh, the farmer uh, farmed the land here and he made a, a hedge or a fence all the way out to the, the, the channel or the stream that was there before. Well, that's a great pathway for the fish. And if they're intact, those fish can, can move up and down on that very easily. You don't need to troll uh, both sides of it. You need to look for little differences. Say there's, a, there's a, uh, a rock or a little change in direction or something in the middle of it. Concentrate on it. Uh, cast and troll it a little bit more. Uh, because the fish will pause that break, something different. If there's a, if there's a break hole in that fence roll, uh, say it rotted out, a part of it rotted out. Forget about it. It's not going to be a pathway all the way to the shallows. Might be wasting your time. Dams. Uh, these are uh, riprap is great to troll because it's clean. A lot of your reservoirs have a lot of wood on them. Uh, the uh, we stack our lures and we troll. Uh, we take the smallest lure. Uh, I don't know if you can see this board down here. When you come up afterwards, when you come, up, you can see it. But there's a a series of seven lures that we use uh, when we spoon plug uh, to map an area as well as fish at the same time. But we take each size and we, we troll along the, uh, we start and we troll along the shallow and we turn around and come back and we troll the next one, turn around and come back and troll the next one. So we're covering all the depths. So if the fish are at a certain depth, uh, we'll catch them as we check our speeds. We, we change our speeds as we do that. Uh, but the answer, uh, riprap is great. Great training for, for learning how to do this. Uh, we take on and off the rocks, go in and out. We need, you need, do need proper equipment, and uh, there's a, a trolling rod we have up here you can take a look at afterwards. Uh, very important to have a good uh, rod that you can feel the ticking of the lure, uh, stiff line that allows you to feel, and uh, that type of equipment is important. Then cut off. This basically is the old river channel, and the dry channel is over here. Well, what they did was they made the dam or the, the road, and they they put the exit of the water out here. Well, this is the channel, the deep water where the fish are. When they move, they're going to contact the structure, the dam up here, and you can tell by getting on the road and just looking on the other side. On the other side, there's the dry river channel. Well, right across from it is the area where you want to concentrate your fishing. At least you want to spend some time there. So basically, it's, it's understanding what, you know, how dams are built a little bit. And causeways. Uh, there's a great causeway in uh, uh, Croton Pond. And uh, good riprap to troll. Uh, this is great because you've got the deepest water in the area, right under the bridge. And then the fish will move from these contact points, then move up onto the structure and go down the, uh, the riprap. Now, they may not, you may not always catch them right here. A lot, of, a lot of times people fish too deep. They'll go, you know, they'll say, well, gee, I'm going to fish over here because this is the contact point. But what if you got a good movement of fish, those fish all moved up here and they're down, way down the other side of the, the break wall? You've got to check them. And uh, you don't know where they're going to be. You can't, if you assume where the depth the fish are going to be at, uh, you may miss a lot of them. So check all your depths and all your speeds. So the causeways can be a great, uh, great crawl. And also, uh, often there's a different water color on the other side of the causeway. You'll find uh, uh, there may be darker water. Well, I'd pick the side of the causeway that's got the darker water to fish because the fish will come shallow, basically. Causeway changes channel. Basically, you've got six areas to fish. These are the contact points. Here's a bar here, a bar here, and the, two, and the two contact points on the side of the channel. So you really should check all of those. A lot of people don't even know this exists. They don't even know it's there. Uh, but by studying the structure, using your depth sounder, using your lures to troll over it and feel it, uh, you know you find it's there. And that's where you want to concentrate. And the best thing to do when you find a spot like that, you say, that's, I, I, you know, that really looks good. Stop an anchor and cast. And cover it a little more thoroughly. Maybe they're slow. Maybe you need to use a jump or something that's moving a little slower. Nothing wrong with that. Even live bait. You know, speed and depth are important. You've got to check them all. 
Uh, this is Lake Makatawa. And uh, where do we start? You know, we get a, we get a contour map like this. And uh, it's not really that accurate, but it does give us some detail, some, some uh, help on that. So how do we find structure situations in our lake? Well, basically, we use the simple tools, the boat, the motor, rod, reel, line, lures, net, markers, depth, sounder, and anchor. And that's pretty basic, and most of us have uh, probably a little more than that. Uh, but uh, those are the things that we have. We pick those out uh, as tools to help us control our depth and speed, because we need to cover this structure, all depths and all speeds. As we're learning it, we're fishing it. Uh, the best way to, to find out what's there is to visualize it in your mind. And uh, that's, that's not too easy because we can't do like the hunter. We can't walk, you know, walk along the pathway and, and look at it. So we have to have some reference point. And one of the reference points we use is a marker. We drop a marker. Say we have a bar coming out, a very simple thing. Or say, say this is the bar here that we're going to fish in Lake Makatawa. Well, say we think here is, a, is a, uh, an area where the bar sticks out the farthest and might be closest to the, to the deep water. We're well, going to drop a marker there, maybe 8 to 10 feet. Then we do our trolling passes, and we look at that marker. We can see, OK, I'm, uh, as I'm going down deeper, I can see that marker, and I know where I am. I can I'm starting to visualize it, and all of a sudden I bang into a, a, a stump or something or, uh, or a change in the direction. OK, now I know the marker's there, and this little bump's over here. I get a picture of what's there. I do some more trolling passes, and I find, boy, there's some hard bottom over here because I can feel it with my rod. Well, I, I make a, note, a mental note of that. When I get all done, I've got a pretty good idea of what's down there. Now, if I caught a fish, I've, I've accomplished my goal. And so what I do is I stop and anchor and cast. I'm on the pathway. If I don't catch a fish, is that failure? No. I've learned a lot. And uh, I, uh, the fish, you know, the fish aren't there, basically. And what, what I can do is, uh, Sit down and, and okay, I, I, at this point in mind, and my memory isn't that long, to be honest with you. I, I don't remember all this stuff unless I really go over it. And so you're on a new structure, and, and you've got a picture in your mind. You're on the water. You're looking there. The point of the bar is there, and this is hard bottoms over here. Put it down on paper. Just take a pencil and paper and mark it down. And uh, what I do is I, I put a number or a letter, like this would be letter A, and then I get out a little sheet of uh, five by seven paper or something. I draw a few markers. Okay, it's uh, th uh, 30 feet deep is the deepest water in the area, and, and I got a break line to 12 feet, and it comes out here a little bit finger here. So I, it maybe take me three minutes or five minutes, and uh, put it away. The, the great thing about that is that next time you come to that structure, if you've taken a line sight or a rifle sight, uh, even if you haven't. You know what's there. You come in there and you take a little look with the depths on it. Oh, here I am. I know that this is over here. I know that's over there. It's down on paper. And so this is how we learn structure and how we improve our fishing. Every time we return to that structure, we don't have to waste a lot of time looking it over that much because we know what's there. And if we do more looking, it's to find more that might be on there. We never find out what everything that's on the structure. But uh, uh, this is the way that we map and uh, try to understand what, what is there. Uh, the marker is very important. We use that because it helps us visualize as we're on the water. You can look at a depth sounder. You can see you know, stuff on the depth sounder. But you don't know where to cast. And you, can, you have to put hundreds of little pictures together to get an idea of what is there. The depth sounder is helpful. Give us some information. But it's when you're on the water and you're looking at the spot, you're looking at the terrain, something's off the point, whatever, uh, you know what's down there. And that's, that's the most, because then you can put your lure there. You can't put your lure in your depth zone. So we use both. Uh, we find the pathways by learning the structure and catching fish. Uh, casting only, uh, you'd, you'd take a long time to learn a structure by just casting. I do use casting to feel what's down there sometimes. And if I, if I fan cast an area, I can feel it's a little harder bottom over here, or there's some rocks over here, or I got a stump over here. That's fine. Uh, but it'd take you forever to learn everything that's down there, especially the form that you're in. Uh, 
Um, let's see. Chase, yes. Can you explain a rifle sighting. Oh, uh, yeah, a rifle. Good, good point. Explain a rifle sighting. What is a rifle sighting? Uh, if you take two objects on the same shore, say on the shoreline you have a dock, and then up on the on the ridge above the the cottages, there's a tall tree behind it. Line up that dock with the tall tree, and you can get to an area, and then you do it on a 90 degree angle. If you take two rifle sightings like that, and I write them down because I can't remember them all, uh, you get two that you can triangulate. You can get to a spot in that lake again next time you come on that spot, and on that lake, that's within the size of a card car, car table. It's very accurate. If you have a, a GPS and know how to use it, that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. But uh, this is really quick, and you make a note of it, and uh, that's one way of doing it. But it's, it has to be two on the same shoreline. You don't just say, well, I'm across from this building, and I'm across from that. That doesn't, that doesn't get you there. You need two rifle sights, and uh, you can be very accurate. Uh, of course, you don't do that in Lake Michigan. You know, <laughs> that's kind of tough. But uh, the... Uh, but in the most inland lakes, you can get some rifle sights. It's no problem. Uh, so once this is done, this mapping, it's easy to check from now on. It, it, it quickens your fishing. Uh, but uh, Terry O'Malley says, if you can't draw it, you don't know it. A lot of guys say, oh, I know that structure. But can they draw it? Well, check yourself sometime. And uh, just kind of, you can improve yourself. And your, it's only for you. It's not for anybody else. You're drawing it down because you want to imprint it in your mind and maybe keep a record of it so next time you come back, you can add some stuff to it. Ever heard of an uh, old salt or a river rat? These guys catch fish. And why do they catch fish? Basically because they spend a lot of time on a, a, a one given water. And uh, like 20 years, you know, and these guys go out there and they'll catch fish on the river or on, the, on a particular lake that they fish for 20 years, and they're good. But the reason they're good is because they know the structure. They know everything about the bottom of that lake. And uh, that's the key, knowing the structure. Uh, we can, by, by studying structure this manner, we can reduce the time from maybe 20 years to get good on a lake to maybe just a few days. And so this is this is makes us allows us to fish a lot of other waters. Uh, football players need to study diagrams and apply themselves to become better players, and fishermen should study structure and apply themselves to become better fishermen. That's that's my not my quote. It's not Buck Perry's quote. <laughs> but anyway, uh, if you and I, this is Buck Perry. If you and I expect to catch more and bigger fish, we must spend our time where we have the best chance to catch a fish. Structure is the key to fishing success. Now this is just a slide to uh, show you how difficult or more structure there is. This is Croton Dam Pond. And there's a lot of structure there. You know, this is the, uh, the causeway there, uh, Little Pond and the Big Pond. Uh, there's a lot of structure there. That's tough. And that's what we need to help us get better at identifying the structure of any lake. We fish one of these, we're going to get better in a natural lake because we know more about structure. Uh, what is the ultimate in fishing? Uh, basically, it's getting into a school of adult fish, and it is fun. Uh, these are fish that, we, that all were caught within an hour's drive of Grand Rapids, and uh, they were all caught in a short period of time. We kept them in the live well with the, with the water running, got them up for a quick picture and released them. Uh, there's nothing, in my opinion, more exciting than getting into a school of adult fish and catching them on one after another. Uh, that is the goal of spoon pluggers, basically. We, don't, we certainly don't do it all the time. In fact, it doesn't come very often. But when we do, it's a memorable experience, and uh, it just can't describe it. It's just very exciting. Uh, what's Buck? Go ahead. Chase, what's Buck Perry's record on uh, number of fish on consecutive casts? Uh, Buck Perry... His record on number of fish, uh, I'm not sure what it's... year it was, but it was 49 bass on 49 consecutive casts, all over three pounds. And he was throwing them over his shoulder and catching another one, throwing them over his shoulder. 
Part of that is speed control. We use the spoon plug because we can get it down and we can crank it fast. The, it's, it's like chickens feeding. Uh, you know, you, you throw food to them and they come faster, you've got you to keep moving and throw more food to them. And uh, once, once you uh, stop, then the excitement is down and they're gone. So, uh, like I say, it doesn't happen all the time. Uh, he did that with newsmen present. And uh, incredible, but some of the history and things that Buck has done over the years. Uh, I, could, I could go on forever, but anyway, that's my daughter. She, she started early and she just loves to, oh, by the way, that's, that's this guy over here. Go back here. Dale, uh, we were on the lake uh, about an hour drive from Grand Rapids and uh, we got some nice fish there. This was, uh, we got in the Grand River, this was in the fall, and uh, we caught, got into a school of smallmouth and a school of catfish, a mess of catfish, we had more fun. It, uh, I did keep one fish here, the steelhead, uh, I love to eat steelhead, and, uh, but we all caught, we caught these in a short period of time, and uh, it's just exciting, because it's nothing like it. Here's my daughter a few years ago, and uh, I started her at five years old. She had this trolling rod, it was the same trolling rod we got up here. Uh, she could hold that and she used her foot to brace it. She was catching 10 pound pike at five years old. Kids, we got well, we got to take kids out and get them interested in fishing. They're, they get so excited. And now she still fishes with me. And uh, it's just, you, you have to take the kids out and, and that's our future in fishing. If we don't do this, then uh, fishing is going to die. And uh, I, I think it's really important to take kids out. So I did start it early. This is my, uh, my niece's little boy, and uh, we got into a school. They weren't large, but they were smallmouth and a few walleyes in the same school, same area. And uh, he couldn't handle, we were casting position. He couldn't handle a casting rod. So I cast it out and I'd hook a fish and I had a rod. And he had a ball. He just, he got so excited on me. Okay. Uh, these are the material, the, the study materials. This is the, the buck. I have a sample of these up front here. And uh, this is Buck Perry's, uh, basically it's the Bible of structure fishing. 300 page book that tells everything about uh, structure and uh, about spoon plugging. This is a, an expanded version of that. And I have a sample up here you can take a look at. And this is the newsletter. We have a uh, uh, newsletter uh, actually, Buck Perry is the only editor of it, or he's the editor of it, and it's the only thing he writes for now. But uh, it's got some good information in it. And uh, on the material I handed out, there is an application if you're interested in getting that newsletter. Uh, there's uh, handouts up here over on the uh, left side. Uh, if you'd like to take some of those, the newsletter and some uh, the talk I gave. Uh, the uh, email sign up is over here. You can come up and see. Uh, uh, that and some of the other materials. Uh, there's a trolling rod up there you can take a look at. Learning successful fishing is a lifetime process. Now I've defined structure and I've shown you the basic structure types that fish use and I've described how you can you can learn to pinpoint the fish using structure. Now it's up to you. With knowledge and effort you too can catch more and bigger fish. It's that simple. That's it. Any questions? If I, would, if I would pick up a topographical map of a, of a lake, where would I start um, to look for, for fish? For fish? Uh, what areas? Topographical map? Uh, yes. Not a contour map. A contour map. Contour okay. map. Contour map. <clears throat> start in the deepest water. Look for the deepest water and then what your structure is. that turn out at all. <laughs>